Welcome back to Design at Large, the lecture series of the Design Lab, home of the World Design Capital uh, with Tijuana. And we are thrilled to be back with the series From the Sky to the Ocean Floor. And um, welcoming to our group this week, Dr. Kal Kalima Lee Moses. Kalima Lee Moses is an assistant professor of urban studies and planning at UCSD. She's joined the department recently, and we really welcome her um, and feel thrilled to have her um, move from Occidental College to UCSD. Her teaching and research combine historical perspectives with discussions about critical contemporary issues related to the built environment of the US and the Pacific. It's very important, um, the work that she's doing here, especially because we, we note every week that we are we are um, situated on Kumeyaay land, and we have addressed that issue in our series and in our work in the design lab consistently since we've opened here at the, at the building. Um, so we're really thrilled to have her extend the discussion to work in the Pacific. Dr. Moses is working on a book about the Hawaii Capitol building mm -hmm. and has um, a piece coming out that will relate to the talk that she's giving today in the journal, can you? Of Pacific Arts. The Journal of Pacific Arts. And we'll be happy to share that on the website when that article is released. So Dr. Kalima Moses, thank you for joining us with your colleague and collaborator, Dr. James Miller, from the Comparative Indigenous Studies Program at Western Washington University. This is, I guess, the seventh of the collaborative projects that we're presenting in featuring collaboration in our series. and. Um, Dr. James Miller is a uh, practicing architect in Hawaii and in Washington state. He advances Moana spatial ontologies within the development of d indigenous design methodologies for architectural projects ranging from housing to educational centers. Through a deep time lens, his research investigates socio-spatial patterns that support cultural continuity in aiding transnational community placemaking from roots, R-O-O-T-S, to roots, R-O-U-T-E-S. They will be speaking about troubling housing, process and pedagogy in Oceania, a contested designation of place, which I'm sure they will be addressing. And their talk will examine the limits, parameters, and innovative possibilities of housing in this place designated Oceania. We're particularly interested, they say, in ways in which planning processes much account, must account for imminent climate considerations and the role of stakeholders who are invested in site-specific and site-responsive approaches to natural and built environments. They'll be engaging in dialogue as a pedagogical mode of outlining the necessity for restorative land and climate justice housing. So welcome, Dr. Moses, and welcome, Dr. Miller. And if you would be so kind as to um, share your PowerPoint on, on my Zoom before we begin so that I can record your, your PowerPoint, that would be great. Thank you. Also, welcome to all the students who are here in person, as well as to all of you who are joining us remotely. I feel like I know all of you, but don't even recognize you. And that's just the weirdest feeling in the world. So welcome in person. And um, I hope that you see some people here who you've seen on the Zoom in previous weeks and that we can have a dialogue this way. OK. Can you see it, Lisa? I can. We're all good. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, James and I would like to thank Lisa and the entire Design at Large team for having us here today. We really enjoyed putting this presentation together and sharing our knowledge and collaborating um, and thinking about issues that are very important, right? Not just to Oceania, but to every part of the world. So thank you for joining us. Um, I'd like to start with Oops, well, this is really <laughs> the land acknowledgement. This public acknowledgement serves to honor and respect indigenous peoples and their land on which our campus resides. UC San Diego was built upon the territory of the Kumeyaay Nation. 
From time immemorial, the Kumeyaay people have been part of this land. Today, the Kumeyaay people continue to maintain their political sovereignty and cultural traditions. I encourage each of us to be accountable to the land and to the Kumeyaay people. For this, it is important that we move beyond land acknowledgments to ask the difficult questions. How can we forge a balanced relationship with the Kumeyaay, their lands, and the ecologies around us? How can we build relationships and do our research about systems of oppression and perhaps our own privilege to serve as allies and or co-conspirators for liberation? And before we continue with our dialogue, I'd like to open with an oli. Um, kind of important part of Moana spatial ontologies is using protocols to open space. So this oli will open our space to accept knowledge from above. Eho mai ka ige mai luna mai e o na mea una noya nona mele eho mai eho mai. E ho mai e, e ho mai ka ike mai luna mai e, o na mea una no yao, no na mele e, e ho mai, e ho mai, e ho mai e. So today we're talking about troubling housing, and our outline is as follows. Um, we're going to do some case studies on Oahu Island, discuss some literature, and then talk about Moana design ontology before we move into another case study, moving from Oahu to uh, Hawaii Island, the big island of Hawaii, and then conclude with an application of Moana design processes, and then we'll open up for questions. Okay. The aina is the connective tissue that sustains Hawaiian health and well-being. It is the land. It is that which feeds. The aina, as explained by Daviana Pumamakai McGregor, is both aina hanau, sands of birth, and kuli'ivi, the resting place of ancestral bones. It is foundational to beliefs and practices. It is, quote, alive, respected, treasured, praised, and honored. For centuries, Kanaka Oivi, or the native Hawaiians, resided in Aupua, self-sustaining parts of the aina that extend from the sea, up the valley ridges, and to the mountains. Wedge-shaped Aupua allowed for equal distribution of natural resources necessary to sustain life. Complex ecosystems within each Aupua provided food, clothing, tools, transportation, and medicine for Kanaka Oivi. It also provided land for shelter. Kanaka designed hale, or houses, using wood ridge posts and rafters to create elongated facades constructed of coconut bark, peely grass, and woven lashings. What's more, Aupua were collective and administered under the general auspices of Ali'i and Mo'i, island rulers and monarchs. Maka Ainana, the people of the land, tended to the daily cultivation of Aupua. We must understand the Aina as all-encompassing. Hawaiian feminist scholar Miley Arvin reminds us that place for Hawaiians is, quote, understood as an ancestor that the people must care for. Thus, land is not property, but a form of genealogy and knowledge, unquote. This oceanic ontology frames the Aina and by extension, kekai and lani, the sea and the heavens, as entangled archives of being. Euro-American scholars often position the Pacific on the periphery of urban studies and architectural history, negating indigenous spatial systems as cities. Yet recent scholarship by artist and architect Sean Connolly uh, proposes that Aupua extend beyond land divisions it is also an urban way of life. Quote, politically, Aupua is architecture, producing some of the most amazing living buildings imaginable. The average Aupua encompasses a surface area of around nine square miles and will take on as many formations as the landscape resources offer, whether hydrological, geological, political, 
or genealogical, unquote. Framing Aupua within academic discourses as a form of urbanism centers indigenous knowledge about the land, water, and other resources that have been, as Connolly notes, lost, stolen, erased, corrupted, or destroyed by colonial and settler colonial interests of the United States. The arrival of Christian missionaries, merchants, um, plantation owners, and political actors attempted to dismantle class and social structures that have long organized and defined Hawaiian society. Of note, the 19th century mahele initiated by Euro-American actors transformed the aina into property. Private land ownership opened the door for the US military and those with money to buy, sell, and lease land. The confluences between land, money, and the legal apparatus of the nation state set the parameters of a settler colonialism predicated not only on settlement, but what on Tiffany King identifies as the violence of genocide, identified through her reading of native and Hawaiian feminist scholars such as Haunani K. Trask and others. Western business interests and the US government acquired land for exploitation and cultivation in Hawaii. In post-statehood Hawaii, so post-1959, island economies became more intimately tied to the United States. Architecture and infrastructure projects were created to support the military, tourism, agriculture, fishing, and manufacturing industries. The resident population and therefore housing in urban Honolulu were influenced by the successes or failures of economic conditions, mortgage lending standards, housing prices, and significant changes in the number of military personnel in Hawaii who are often accompanied by their dependents. What we end up seeing in the last 15 years in particular are the construction of single family homes and townhomes outside of the city in rezoned land that had previously been reserved for agriculture. The density of urban Honolulu, meanwhile, requires the construction of primarily condominium developments for purchase or rent. Contemporary Hawaii architects take seriously sustainability imperatives. Pacific Islands are among those most at risk for climate change. The devastating impacts we recently saw during the January 2022 tsunami in Tonga, where the waves inundated Tonga's capital city and where the effects could be felt along the U.S. West Coast, Peru, Aotearoa, and Japan. The Pacific Islands Ocean Observing System indicates that, quote, scientific literature as well as government and multinational reports increasingly point to about three feet of sea level rise by the year 2100 as a mid-range rather than a high-end scenario and show that sea level rise greater than three feet in this century is physically possible, specifically in Hawaii. Climate research demonstrates that it is not a matter of if coastal cities and districts will be impacted by rising sea levels, but when and how. In the Hawaiian archipelago, erosion caused by sea level rise, climate shifts, and pollution forces the islands to subside into the oceanic crust under its own massive weight. Degraded coral reefs cannot quell the islands' loss of elevation. This fact is particularly important for residential communities along the Oahu coastline. One such residential community on, on Oahu's coastline is our Kakawako, an ongoing urban revitalization project. Our Kakawako is located on 29 acres wedged between downtown Honolulu and Ward Village, and the land is administered by the Kamehameha Schools. Over 20,000 households within a one mile radius rent or own a variety of units in mid-rise and high-rise structures throughout our Kakawako. The collection is one such residential project in our Kakawako. The collection is a mixed use structure with 397 condominiums in a central tower, a 54 unit four story mid rise building, 14 townhomes, five commercial spaces, and a six story parking structure. The three primary residential spaces are a stark visual contrast. The 43 story tower soars into the sky and the facade is punctuated with equidistantly spaced balconies at every level, wrapping around the entirety of the structure. 
Low E glass projects a crisp silver blue hue from a building that captures the sky's color and the city's ambient environment. The lofts function as a transition point between the tower and the townhomes. The white, gray, and burgundy mid-rise building features large paned windows divided into variously arranged sections, adding visual dimension and artistry to the exterior. The windows give the impression of wide open interior spaces and high ceilings, architectural features usually associated with lofts and former industrial centers. The four-story townhomes offer ample square footage and access to private rooftop decks. Deep burgundy exterior frames outline the white facade as long vertical windows extend the height of the building and less foliage lines the sidewalks and entryways of each home. The collection nods to environmental sustainability. Low E glass radiates less energy, allowing each unit to transmit less heat. And recycled materials and a multi-zone ductless air conditioning system make each unit energy efficient. Kamehameha schools, the architects for surrounding high rises, high rises, and city planners also work together to make accommodations for a future rail stop in the area, a move that acknowledges the impact of public transportation in reducing greenhouse gas emissions that directly impact climate change. Yet these steps are not enough. U.S. urban planning and architectural design does not fully work in a native context where the violence of settler colonialism continues through the denigration of the land and the sea. Ecological disturbances have severe architectural and urban implications, particularly for our Kakawako, a land reclamation project. This means that Kakawako is built on filled land, an area where the land has been raised by depositing materials such as clay, rock, and gravel, and then compacting the fill at regular intervals as the level or the grade of the land continues to rise. Kakawako's relatively flat cartography at sea level makes it especially vulnerable to sea level rise and climactic changes resulting in hurricanes and tsunamis. Buildings and structures in our Kakawako are susceptible to flooding, groundwater inundation, and saltwater contamination in the local aquifer system. The Alawai Canal, a mere 2.5 miles east of the collection, is another example of the failures of Western architectural and infrastructural planning to account for Hawaii seascapes and landscapes. As Sarah Jensen Carr notes, quote, colonialist engineering projects like the Alawai Canal often view all water, rain, streams, oceans, as a uniform substance to be manipulated without regard to the hydrological complexity that indigenous science has long maintained, managed in order to keep ecosystems in balance, unquote. My students at Occidental College in spring 2019 witnessed this firsthand. With funds from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and from the college, I traveled to Honolulu with seven undergraduate students enrolled in my upper division course titled Building the Quote Unquote American Pacific. One of our events included visiting the Alawai Canal, an engineering project completed in 1928 that drains rivers and streams into the Pacific Ocean. The project effectively consolidated many of Oahu's natural rivers and streams, making way for land to develop as real estate, most infamously for Waikiki. My students met up with Charles Roach, founder and producer of Aloha Films, to examine the architectural landscape around the Alawai. The best way to capture imagery of a city that followed in the modernist architectural trajectory as other US cities was to use drones. And that's its own thing. We can talk about that in the Q&A. Um, but we met up with Charles at the Alawai Community Park to receive instruction about how to fly the drones, the heights to which we could fly them, and allowable parameters. Each student took turns flying the drones and taking photographs. Our conversations about the Alawai Canal were twofold. On the one hand, it's centered around the perilous conditions for residents living along the Alawai Canal. The canal's frequent flooding from heavy rains endangers the lives of over 200,000 people who live and work along its path from Makiki to Manoa to Palolo to Mo'ili'ili. According to a study produced by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the city and county governments, Severe flooding could potentially result in certain areas being under five feet of water in the near future. The famed Waikiki, 
once the home for many Hawaiian ali'i, and now known for its tourist hotels, could be completely wiped out. Secondly, the canal is an untenable biosphere. Waste from raw sewage and pesticides have ruined the canal as a source of food or exercise for humans and mere existence for non-human living beings or living entities. The students' exposure to the Alawai Canal revealed that water is not simply a resource to be controlled or managed. Rather, va'a, water, or kikai, the sea, is a source of knowledge. As Karen Ingersoll describes in the book Waves of Knowledge, a Seascape Epistemology, the Hawaiian relationship to water is a source of knowledge about interconnected systems. The ocean is, to quote Ingersoll, quote, an instrument of migration, transportation, and a source of food, medicine, and shelter, as well as spiritual right and responsibility, or kuleana, to the sea expressed in the concept of malama aina, or caring for the land. The ocean is where we cleanse, dance, play, train, and die. It is the point from which we have always leapt off, physically and philosophically, into our past and our futures." Unquote. Drone images of the Alawai Canal taken by my Oxy students became part of an exhibition that they curated at Weingart Gallery titled Hawaii Through the Lens. As the exhibition introduction maintained, quote, this exhibition utilizes photography as a medium to showcase Honolulu's monumental architecture, to critically think about US colonial, neo-colonial, and imperial influences in the Pacific, unquote. The students critiqued social media and militarism effects on Hawaii and its people by leaning into Edward Said's proclamation in Culture and Imperialism, where he says, just as none of us is outside or beyond geography, none of us is completely free from the struggle over geography. That struggle is complex and interesting because it is not only about soldiers and cannons, but also about ideas, about forms, about images and imaginings, unquote. Thus the research for this project and the exhibition itself revealed the ways in which federal and state governments, as well as private investments, place too great, great an emphasis on post-impact mitigation, rather than on the maintenance of Kanaka lifeways and ecologies. In her 2021 book, Mapping Abundance for a Planetary Future, Kanaka Maoli and Critical Settler Cartographies in Hawaii, Candace Fujikani centers this premise of native ecologies and knowledge as the way to engage with the natural world. She discusses what she calls cartographies of capital, ways of interpreting landscapes and seascapes within late liberal settler states as altered by force and will. She engages with the Anthropocene through the lens of colonialism, imperialism, industrialism, and militarization actions imparting environmental devastation for the benefit of capital accumulation, i.e. growth and economic wealth through profits. Cartographies of capital, according to Fujikani, quote, do not merely depict the symptoms of a planet laid waste by late liberal settler states and globalization, but are themselves the primary driving force in climate change, unquote. It is the story of capital's relationship to the earth, in citing the work of Ku'ule Kanahele, Fujikane describes the reactionary approach of states and governments toward damaged ecosystems, in large part caused as a result of their own policies and regulations. Human actors and their institutions turn toward reforestation, architectural mitigation, etc., after the harms have already been committed, rather than eliminating developmental harms from the beginning. Instead, Fujikani advocates for an epistemological shift towards what she calls economies of abundance, steeped in Kanaka Oivi, moors about the land, the sea, and the sky. She points to the cultivation of lo'i kalo, or taro pond fields, and the restoration of Hawaii's dry land forests as just two examples among many of ecological lessons that can reshape the Earth's climate future. Throughout the book, Fujikani tracks pathways of water through mo'olelo, or stories, 
weaving narratives of the human and the non-human together to stress the importance of connectedness and the responsibility that each has toward the other. Fujikani spends considerable time discussing Mauna Awakea, or Mauna Kea, a sacred mountain on Hawaii Island that has been in the news for the last two years. Kanako Levy have staged large scale protests against the construction of the 30 meter telescope at its summit. Scientists hail TMT as a device that will assist in the study of distant galaxies, black holes, and the formation of first stars and planets. The project is a collaborative effort by a nonprofit international partnership between several universities and research councils of note, Caltech and the University of California. Researchers and scientists plan for TMT at Mauna Kea Summit as if it is an empty space without history. Yet Fujikani quotes the Kumulipo, the Hawaiian creation and cosmonic chant, to explain the genealogy of Mauna Avakea, to assert that the summit is the child of Papahanamoku, the earth, and Vakea, the sky, and thus the elder sibling of the Kalo plant and the elder sibling of all Kanako Oivi. Fujikani continues, quote, the genealogy of water on Mana Avakea speaks to currents of connection and abundance. Water that collects on the Kalo plant is sacred because it has not yet touched the earth. And water on Mana Avakea is most sacred because it has the highest source of water that flows to feed the island, unquote. Kanaka protest of TMT is an act to protect an ancestor and an act of reciprocal care. The book's conclusion is particularly important because it envisions an environmental future beyond capital. Fujikani makes the bold proclamation that cartographies of capital, like that which, we under, which underscores the design of the Alawai Canal, the collection in Arkakawako, and TMT plans for Mauna Kea must be uprooted to make way for sustainable systems that draw on Hawaiian epistemes that are compatible with the needs of the natural world. The question then becomes, what does it look like in practice for architects and designers who seek to implement progressive ecologically based designs? And for that, and for a possible answer, <laughs> I'll turn it over to James. Thank you. All right, so let's see if I can come up with an answer. What becomes increasingly clear in climate change adaptation rhetoric and carbon neutrality is that these frameworks come out of the same logics that form what Candace Fujikani identifies as cartographies of capital. If we do not fundamentally transform the process, the underlying logic system, then we have no hope in addressing the impacts of carbon emission and mitigating and adapting to climate change. Rather, we continually produce technocratic solutions that provide band-aids and increase inequities. This is what me and my colleagues in Hawaii call the, in, the impl, impl, impacts of continental mindsets when we need to have islander-centric mindsets. So recently, I began working with Kanaka Maoli-based development agencies and a few other stakeholders addressing the housing crisis on Hawaii Island such as Vibrant Hawaii. They pointed out an issue that we were all too aware of in indigenous communities. Current building regulations and land use codes are, increasingly, are increasing inequality, making housing affordability more inaccessible. What we see now is that cost burden of climate adaptation is being placed on inhabitants, a pattern that disproportionately impacts low to moderate income communities. There is already distrust among indigenous communities with these regulatory frameworks. For example, most communities I work with do not want HUD in their back door. These regulatory bodies ignore the burden of costs because they're built, on the tech, built by technocrats trained in rigid solutions. This is why work like mapping abundance is so important today. We need to redirect our energies as designers, architects, engineers, and planners away from cartographies of capital and toward cartographies of abundance. In transforming our own logic systems, we can transform our current um, operating system. So as an architect and educator, for me, this comes in three forms in employing this process. 
So one is to transform my own logic system. We could call that the metaphorical decolonization and engage with Kapuna and Iwi Kapuna. Um, we could call that the indigenous or indigenizing process. And then two is to develop new frameworks built through these understandings, these relationships, and understand how indigenous, indigenous knowledge can be utilized within architecture and environmental design to produce architectures of abundance. And then three, as an educator, to educate non-indigenous students how to bridge between Western and indigenous knowledge systems and to educate indigenous students to be empowered by their ancestors and ancestral knowledge. So I wanna introduce a Moana design philosophy, a way of thinking that is rooted in the land as land-based ethical frameworks and principles of abundance that guide us in community work. So to start through the research I've conducted over time um, in Eilang Kainad, or the Republic of the Marshall Islands, and in Hawaii, I've come upon six-ish, we'll lump it up to six, um, common patterns within environmental design. So one is that is the aina. And as um, Kalima introduced us to, the, the ecological system of the ahapua. And if we think, or if we interpret what aina means, it's the land that feeds us. Land is a resource that provides for all. And then there's the mo'o aina. So mo'o describes the continuity of something. So it's the continuity of that land. And if we think about mo'oku ahau, mo'oku ahau is our genealogy. Genealogy, our own gene genealogy to our ancestors as well as the genealogy of the land. And that starts to identify us through the land. And the way this was taught to me by um, Keiki Aloha was that where our ancestors' bones lie is the land that we're responsible for. A third pattern is ho'okahi and kuleana. It's our responsibility built on our kind of collective action as a community, or we can determine this as togetherness is another term. And this starts to in, enforce, or yeah, enforce the way we start to settle in place in order to assist each other. A why why or vai vai which was brought up as abundance. Um, how do we design for abundance? And how do we build that within our everyday lives? Um, in Rudy Majel, there's the term Joankijek. It's the one fire from which feeds us all. The idea that we collectively um, manage the land to ensure our own survival as well as the sustainability into future generations. And then a fifth pattern, kauhale, which is a traditional settlement pattern of Kanaka Oiwi um, based on a low impact development and um, material culture built within sustainable practices. And then lastly, laulima, laulima being the process of collective action, of collective kokua or help that leads to the development of buildings where we help each other build housing for all. So from these patterns, what I wanted to start understanding was how do we develop new design processes that both integrate them, but also, in, but also respond to, the, to any um, place that we're creating um, in a way that reinforces these patterns. So this process was introduced to me, the one on the right, not the one on the left, was introduced to me um, by WCIT architects Rob Yopa and Ruben Choke, um, as well as Malia Kaaihue of Details, um, who developed this MOO methodology, um, also with Zig Zane of Edith Kanaole Foundation. And I've added a bit and tweaked a bit, um, but more or less it's the original um, MOO methodology that Malia developed. And MOO, as I kind of mentioned, is this idea of succession or continuity. It, we think of it in genealogy and family. We are the branches of a tree and the trunk is our ancestor. 
mo'o carries knowledge and meaning. All right, so now to walk through, well, first, before walking through the process. Um, within this design process is embedded an indigenous, con an indigenous concept of time and space. In, um, in Kanaka Oiwi, we think of this through the proverb of Ikawamamua, Kawamahope, that we walk backward into the future, looking to our ancestors for answers, answers to provide for our future ancestors. So diagrammatically, what it looks like is that we're the wa in the center and everything else is beyond. It represents a collapse of temporalities. So when we implement that kind of thinking at the beginning, it's important that we understand the mo'okuahao, the genealogy of place, as well as the mo'olelo, the narratives of that place. And the narratives of that place aren't just about the community that lives there now. It's not just about the species that live there now but it's about all species across time and space that have occupied that land. Because through those stories, we learn about the ecological science. Um, Candace Fujikane explains this in Mauna Kea um, through the cosmogony of the Papa of Akea story and our filial responsibility through the birth of Haloa, as well as the representation of deities um, like the Mo'o, the lizard guardians um, that reflect various ecological knowledge. So the essence, if we listen to the Mo'olelo, we learn from the land and from our ancestors. So the next part of the design phase is the huaka'i. So the practice to quote, again, Candice Pujikane's uh, mapping abundance, the practice of huaka'i is an embodied one. We walk the land in a physical, spiritual, and intellectual journey to celebrate places in what Kukau Uakahi describes as a cultural and spiritual walk in the footsteps of our ancestors that allows us to see the land through their eyes. In this way, Uakahi is a pico that connects past, present, and future generations, again, through this collapsing of temporalities. And I add here Ike Hunua, or the knowledge of, of, the, of the land, how we learn from the land, and the land as teacher. And then the second component of this is Vaivai, that all that we do is building towards abundance now and abundance into the future, learning through those lessons. So Huaka'i also speaks to the, Ma Ma the Maoli perspective of weaving. In the past before us, Dr. Mahena Vaughan considers weaving an indigenous epistemology that stems from land-based practices of Kua Aina, which Daviana McGregor calls the backbone of the land. Working within community, we weave together and maintain reciprocal relationships, raising each other up and building resilience within our relationships to the environment. In thatching a hale, as depicted here with Uncle Scotty at Hola Aina in Kalihi Valley, um, the weaving is a central process. While it is a technology, it is much more. To weave, we have to first grow the resources. There's a direct connection between natural resource and material artifact. Within the closed loop ecological economy, we build relationships with the land and those who work and manage the land. We are sure to not take too much in order to allow for abundance. As much as we use weaving as a metaphor, it becomes a way of life. And then in the third phase, the whole Lahui to raise a nation, the famous saying of King Kalakawa is a Hawaiian um, is a is a way of perpetuating Hawaiian culture in this case in design of the environment through design construction and continued maintenance of a project, and then lastly La Lima, this idea of building together. So the Maka Ainana worked cooperatively and shared the fruits of labor, or La Lima. Most of this labor was done within the context of the ohana, or the family, as the primary unit of production. And the ohana lived in dispersed clusters, the kahale, on the ili land granted to them. Within the ohana, there was also the cooperative enterprise and reciprocal exchange of labor called kokua, which we now typically interpret as help. It's the idea of that um, sharpening the steel together where it builds a stronger community. So then the last phase is 
how do we maintain any given project, any given site, is through a land-based ethic of aloha aina. And aloha aina represents the ground and normativity of Kanaka Oui, which, as Glenn Cuthard and Leanne Simpson explain, is a land-based ethical framework. So to broaden this indigenous design approach, I've created this um, process diagram, which can be re relational with other indigenous communities, such as a project that I'm working currently with the Lactamish um, tribe in Washington. So now to provide the application of this model within a couple of projects um, and seeing how it responds, or in, in a way to respond to this framework of a land-based ethic. So these projects start with relationship developed with Hou Hui, which is the parent organization of a school that was lost to the 2018 lava flows from Kilauea. And this is the Kua Okala Public Charter School in Puna, which was on. So the school was located on Pua'a'a, Ahapua, which is a well-known Ahapua of Puna um, for its uh, cultural resources. So it has ancient fishing, uh, ancient loi ponds, as well as um, iwi burial grounds, so ancestral burying grounds and fish ponds. And how we under how we get to understand Pualaa when the broken record of oral when the record of oral history is broken is through um, historic documents like this um, parcel map. Um, created in the mid-1800s, as well as a mo'olelo um, written in the Hawaiian newspaper, this one's from 1865, that speak to the significance of these sites. And then now today, Pu'ala'a is under roughly 100 feet of lava. So the, the challenge for Ho'olohui was how do you move this, how do you take the richness of this school that really was embedded within land-based education through the cultural resources of Pu'ala'a and move it to you know, essentially what's available, um, both through econo economically available as well as just locations that can host a K through 12 school. Um, so one, so what we started to work on is the visioning of the school, which is a renovation of a place called Nani Ma, which is a botanical garden or former botanical garden in Hilo. And um, utilizing the resources of a botanical garden to try to recreate some of the essence of the land-based components of Pula'a. Um, and then the other part was to stick in Pona, Puna and develop a land-based education center. So not necessarily the school, but perhaps the center. So what we started to work on was um, Ike o Keahialaka, an education center um, based as a um, food resilience hub for Puna. And it's that red area there, located in Nanavali, Ahapua. Right. So what I want to do is use this project to walk through the method um, and implementation of this design process. So it starts with this mokuahau, which is also thinking through deep time. And again, that genealogical memory and woven fabrics of history, chants, stories, and songs that are passed from generation to generation, and how to utilize this project also as a mode to revive practices for um, passing on to future generations. So this starts again, as I mentioned, with looking at what we have available when the oral traditions are broken. So looking at historical maps to understand what is the land use of this place and how how can we learn from previous land uses that have been obliterated by subdivisions and real estate speculation um, or waste landing, as Kalima brought up, in order to revive um, the traditional uses? Um, so these maps from 1901 and 1886 start to provide some reference to what was developed in this area. So zooming in, looking at Puna, and granted this is after the Haley Act, but we're not going to get into that. Um, we see some of the uses, plantations, there's cultural resources, um, there's homestead lands, 
uh, so areas that were predominantly occupied by Hawaiian, uh, Hawaiian families. Um, uh, there's also uh, conservation areas. And then there's a lot of this designated land that has the term wasteland attached to it. Generally, that's lava fields um, that don't have a lot of vegetation. And then the next step is thinking through the mo'olelo of this place. So the mo'olelo of Puna, we look to the story of Keahialaka. So to read an excerpt from the story of Keahialaka. So when Pele came to the island of Hawaii, she first stopped at a place called Keahialaka in the district of Puna. From this place, she began her inland journey toward the mountains. As she passed on her way, there grew within her an intense desire to go at once and see Ailao, the god to whom Kilauea belonged, and find a resting place with him at the end of her journey. She came up, but Ailao was not in his house. He had made himself thoroughly lost. He had vanished because he knew that this one coming toward him was Pele. He had been her toiling, he had seen her toiling down by the sea of Keahialaka, trembling dread and heavy fear overpowered him. He ran away and was entirely lost. When she came to that pit, she laid out the plan for her abiding home, beginning at once to dig up the foundations. She dug day and night and found that this place fulfilled all her desires. Therefore, she fastened herself tight to Hawaii for all time. So here we see how Keahialaka in this part of Puna is, is positioned within the cosmology of Hawaiians within the, sto the origin story. It also speaks directly to what we now identify as the, um, blanking on the name, sorry, <laughs> of the, uh, well, lava zone one or the um, ridge line for Kilauea's flows, where it's most likely to have eruptions um, consistently. Of course, over time, we've had things like Leilani Estates developed right on top of, of this ridge line. Sorry if you can't see my mouse. It's the red. Um, going from Kilauea out to Kapoho, that point out there. Um, so this home of Pele is embedded within this understanding of the ecology of place. And then speaking to the Mihaly, another place to understand this, this land is utilizing Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Um, GIS database, which also has um, markers for important cultural art, or important cultural um, spaces, as well as um, the land ownership records. So, with this particular project that we're looking through, this mo'okuahau of the place was to think of how can this development of Ikeo Keahialaka be a kipuka. A kipuka are the repositories of culture and knowledge. They have the potential to revive and perpetuate indigenous practice and more respectful relationships with land and sea. So even as Pele claims and reconstructs the forest landscape, she leaves intact whole sections of the forest. We kind of see a kipuka here um, in the midst of the lava flows. And these oases become the seed banks for regrowth. So how do we see the development of a place becoming that seed bank for regrowth in our cultural ways of life. So looking at um, Nanavale in this part of Puna, which is over here, oops, we see that it has a wealth of resources of Ohia, Ohia being a very significant um, cultural resource. Um, it's one of the first trees to start growing amongst the pohoi hoi, the smooth lava flows, um, and it starts to provide the undergrowth and um, protection for the, the kind of re rebirth of a place after lava as well. Um, the unfortunately, in county of Hawaii, as well as um, in other places, oh, rapid ohia death has come to the islands, leading to the decimation of many of these forests. So going off along the lines of kipuka is how to, to revitalize the ohia. And unfortunately, when you have rapid ohia death, you start to have invasives becoming more um, prevalent. So here's the site in orange um, within the red zone, red zone being Nanavali Estates. 
Uh, and you can see it's adjacent to these two little purple patches. Those are two of the remaining Ohia conservation forests in Puna. So as I mentioned with the rapid proliferation of invasive species, um, in particular as the Ohia forests begin to die through ra rapid Ohia death, we have the proliferation of Albizia. Albizia being a pretty fast growing um, tree that was brought to Hawaii to help re-establish forest canopy. Um, but in areas like uh, Puna, it's starting to cause lots of negative impacts, such as sucking too much water up from the ground to creating, its canopies are really large, so then sun's not getting down to the um, um, lower plants and causes other issues. So part of this project is understanding how to utilize, again, rapid Ohia death, revitalization of Ohia, and the removal of invasives within this, this land-based education program. And then on layering on top of that is how do we utilize the histories, so the lava flow of 1840 in this case, um, that speak to that greater mo'okuahau or mo'oaina of the land. And then lastly is important orientation. So speaking to the story of Papa and Vakea, uh, building their home on Mauna Kea, there's a significance for every peak adjacent to any Ahapua that you create a sight line from that um, mountaintop to the ocean, from Mauka to Makai. Um, so in this case, the blue line is Kilauea, which is the nearest um, peak, and also the direct line of that um, path Pele came to settle in. Um, so we chose that as a significant orientation. Um, the yellow is Mauna Loa, and the purple is Mauna Kea, to give you some ideas. And then one last kind of Moana ontology to think through in the development of place is a term called Va or Wa Moana. And what Va Moana speaks to is our relationships. And it's not just our relationships to one another, our relationships to one another and to land, and how um, spatial organization starts to contribute or weaken those relationships. So as we begin to walk with our ancestors and future ancestors, learning from place-based knowledge, we nurture this relationship across space and time. And Va Moana guides these relational aspects of spatial organization and design. In Kanaka Oiwi ontologies, Wa also connects through Mo'oku Ahau to cosmogony of our people and place. And one place we find this is through the Kumulipo, which was brought up earlier. Um, and thinking through how the Kumulipo starts to define spatial orders, um, such as how each verse in the Kumulipo is a Wa. And in this image, we have a Kanaka Oiwi sailing with a Yapese wayfinder in a prawa, a Marshallese style outrigger, which demonstrates this collapsing of both ontologies across Moana or across Oceania into the creation of technology that transverses the ocean and brings people, communities closer together. So this is the type of mindset to have when you're going on a huaka'i with community stakeholders in a project is how do you take multiple knowledge systems across a community that's no longer just Kanaka Maoli, but is broad, has a broader, um, a broader groups, cultural groups within it, and thinking about how to represent everyone's um, a stake within this development. So here we worked with various um, other food resilience hubs in Hawaii County. We worked with the urban planning department of the county, as well as other organizations that um, were close to um, Nanavali, where this might benefit them. And this aerial gives you a sense of those albizias. Um, so you can see the ohia, the kind of the tall, narrower trees. Albizias have those huge canopies. And then this is a sight line looking back to Kilauea using drones. And here's just a conceptual design of, of the place, um, utilizing a um, iwi, or not iwi, sorry, a um, emu 
and so he moves the back covered space, and then a large meeting house, which is actually designed in the Marai, or not the Marai, the uh, um, Maranga style, which is a Samoan fale, as opposed to a Kanaka Aoiwi fale, or hale. Um, but these are just ideas that came out of communities' visions. And then we have a Kalo field. We don't know if the Kalo field will make sense. That's taro. It's likely going to be sweet potatoes, because sweet potatoes can grow in the cracks of a'a, whereas Kalo doesn't do as well. All right, so, this, so that kind of presents the method. And now to quickly go through the last um, example and application is a project that I've more recently begun working on with Vibrant Hawaii, their Vibrant Community Housing Program, which is trying to look at how to develop models for innovative housing for Hawaii County. So what Vibrant Hawaii has started to develop um, in, in conjunction with a Hawaii County's uh, planning department is a GIS database that starts to locate um, state-owned or Department of Hawaiian Homelands owned properties that could provide housing develop future housing development um, to address the um, current affordable housing crisis and provide more ex access to affordable housing for low to moderate income families. And again, they're fairly against utilizing HUD structures to help in this process um, due to a distrust amongst the community with the regulations of HUD. So they're used, so again, state owned or Department of Hawaiian Homelands. And then also they need to be properties that are within a close proximity to infrastructure. Um, so infrastructure including cable, electrical, optimally water and waste, but not necessarily. So like this purple in the lower map is an identified Department of Hawaiian Homelands site in um, Puna. It's one of the largest in the area. And it has very low access to um, potable water from at least a municipal source. Um, and it would have to get water from an aquifer under Maku'u, which is just, if I walk away, I'll knock off the microphone. Um, it's just over there. So there is the possibility to use the other Department of Hawaiian Homelands um, aquifer to supply water there. Uh, and then waste would have to be dealt with locally through septic. Um, so it's not optimal but it's one of the only locations available to service a big population, a growing population of commuters. Um, so the second criteria is looking at what are the risks and hazards. Um, so flooding is the top map, and the lower is its proximity to the lava um, zones. So lava zone one is the red, lava zone two is the orange, lava zone three is the uh, yellowish um, area. And those zones basically determine the free, how, what's the likelihood of the frequency of a lava flow to hit that location. So as we see, that location is relatively outside of the high danger zones. So once we've established these, the land, we're also looking similarly at those, the mo'olelo, the mo'okohao of the place to understand um, its use and then going through a huaka'i with the community to understand how the community sees these locations best meeting their needs. And those needs might be proximity to work, might be proximity to their ancestral homes, et cetera. Um, then we start to develop actual housing models for these places that are not formed within our typical continental mindsets or Western mindsets, but learning from um, the large, in this case, Pacific in Puna, Pacific Island community um, that we've been working with, um, mostly Kanaka Oliwi but others such as Marshallese, Chukis, other um, Samoan, Tongan, and utilizing housing practices that are culturally specific um, to support um, these community members. So here we're looking at how do you kind of, so we think about these communities, lots of Kanaka, Samoan, Tongan, Marshallese have moved from their Kauhale systems with separate um, units, separate sleeping units, with shared kitchens, et cetera, into our typical two, three bedroom um, you know, Western track home. So what we're looking at is essentially unpacking or uh, deconstructing, once again, the typical track home into patterns that utilize um, both cultural specificity, but also within that cultural specificity with the um, broken up sleeping units from kitchens and bathrooms, as you start to take out the bathrooms and kitchens, expensive spaces to construct, 
and become shared amenities, which starts to lower costs for a higher number of, of units. Um, and then the units also allow for incremental growth. So, and, and we see policies that are starting to allow for this. This is an example from where I currently live in Bellingham, Washington. Um, there's other examples in, in Oregon, California, Minnesota, et cetera, um, that provide uh, more flexibility for um, development typologies like cottage um, villages, um, et cetera. Um, so we're looking at how to start to reshape policy in County of Hawaii um, as well through these reconceptualizations of housing models. Um, so here's an example of a, of a proposed um, tiny home village that utilizes this kind of kahale model um, as a way of breaking down um, units and, and the costs associated with um, shared amenities and also a system or a proposed, yeah, program that allows for incremental development over time and the idea of laulima shared help within the process of construction. So to conclude, while many recent calls for qualifications and proposals speak to the need of cultural specificity and experience working with native and indigenous communities, these bureaucratic procedures are not responding to the requests of native and indigenous communities, not unlike the issues of technocracy mentioned before. So similar to how settlers see empty space as desolate, architects and planners continue to see native and indigenous communities as inept to carry forward their own work. So what I see is a deep need for training indigenous environmental designers grounded in land-based ethical frameworks of their community who will uplift their people, their knowledges, and create more resilient communities. So to end with Okamako Kemalawa, Kemalama, Ika Aina. It is our responsibility to care for the land. And through this relationship, we maintain balance. Mahalo nui loa. Thank you so much. Sorry, everybody. Um, Dr. Moses, Dr. Miller, thank you so much for your, for your talks. Um, so you're picking up so many themes that we've discussed in different ways throughout the weeks of these seminars, most recently with Danielle Dean and Stephanie Sherman talking about Fordlandia and the creation of, of the westernized housing structures there and the, the, um, the willful denial of the need for housing that comes from community needs and comes from land-based needs and that respects the, the land and that ultimately failed. Um, I would like to um, go to questions both in the room here and in the audience online, but I just wanted to start off with a, a sort of large question about your collaboration, which, um, so Dr. Moses, you're working very closely with a tradition of, of critique of development and, and a critique of a particular colonial Western model of development. And you're also working very closely with the coastal. And I realize that much of Hawaii is, is coastal because of the, the island structure. But I was very struck by the shift, Dr. Miller, to your presentation, which brings us not only to a land-based ethics and this concept of abundance, which really powerfully struck me, and I, I want to hear more from you about that concept, um, but also the move inland. And the reason I ask about that is because um, some of us here in this room and on the Zoom and in the larger community of San Diego have been working with, uh, with the Kumeyaay groups in the community around um, land rights and land management and uh, land reclamation um, and conservation of land traditions. And uh, so Nan Renner is here. Uh, we, we've been working with uh, Stan Rodriguez and um, the, the groups working around building uh, canoes, but also working around uh, the, the politics of housing and a building AWAS in inland communities, but always the development and the activity is inland. 
and I feel like we live in this in this rim along the coast that remains the highest real estate, the most um, traditionally developed uh, colonized area that's so close to the slides that we saw that, that Dr. Moses, you showed us. So how do you begin in your joint practice to move this, this um, practice that's, that's organized around abundance to the shore, to that really contested land at the shore, because that's a big that's a big issue for what we're trying to do here. You know, we can't even keep the boats on a piece of real estate, you know, because it's 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 so fraught. So the question is is about this relationship between the inland and the shore and the uh, the shore, and how you move the politics to the most contested land. So your first part of the question, uh, the collaboration between James and I, I think works really well because it's this combination of theory and practice. And that's something in USP, right, that we really <laughs> sort of harp on what we want our students to learn, right? History, theory, and practice. Um, and so um, I think we complement each other in that way in what we're... Urban studies, urban studies and planning, I'm sorry, USP is <laughs> urban studies and planning. Um, to the second part of your question, and James, you can disagree with me if you like, I, I don't know if I'd frame the question quite in that way, because our discussion of Aupua was about inland and the sea, right, going in and out, right, the resources that can be garnered all the way inland in the island, on the island and to the shore, and how these resources are used to sustain entire communities. Right, so it's not just about being near the va or the water, or not just about being on the mountain, right? It's about how do we integrate these resources together as each part is being vital to sustaining communities and indigenous lives. Um, you wanna add or disagree? <laughs> yeah, I guess, I'll, I, I mean, I agree. I would add to it, um, like, Taking a different example, I mean, it works. So Ahapua is a clear example of your Makai water um, hydrology, right? The water is being collected in, in the mauna, in the mountain. It's being stored in aquifers. Those aquifers are starting to pour down in streams down to um, all the way down to the coast. And as, as long as that water maintains its a high, I don't know, how, this is, I, I'm not a, uh, Ecologist by nature, but as it maintains its quality um, through all the systems that it naturally passes through, then the health of the coastal environment is maintained. But as we start to build culverts and dredge and and put fertilizer on lawns, um, as we start to build telescopes on top of Mauna, it starts to negatively impact the water source as it moves down. I think we all kind of identify this. It's the same system, similar system here where you have the water as moving from the mountains to the coast. Um, and you know we have this issue with snowpack not being maintained, and that's causing all kinds of problems. Because the quality of water for um, the livelihoods of species at the coastline is being dramatically impacted. And um, then, of course, development along that, that mountain, the, what, what I've recently learned to call white cap to white cap. That's a um, Washington geography. Um, is an effective way of thinking about how development practices start impacting the quality of, of that place. And I think the specific con contestation of you know, shoreline, shorelines, especially in like Oahu or Maui, and then the, the Kailua Kona coast of, of, um, of Hawaii Island being these high real, estate pro um, high real estate areas with lots of speculative development, and you know, it becomes a billionaire class that don't want um, that don't want to have to either worry about the inland population. Um, but the reality is that everyone should be worrying because the system is so interconnected that the vi viability of even those coastal houses existing in 50 years is, is largely, well, it's okay, there's sea level rise. And then there's also the impacts of any type of eroded um, component of that whole ecological system. 
So like the Alawai Canal being a great example um, that, that I've learned a lot from Sean Connolly um, and his product on the LOI Centennial um, is a really great example because the United States Army Corps of Engineers has come in to try to mitigate um, the flood potential that would be catastrophic for Waikiki and the real estate endeavors of all those developers, um, as well as the popula human population that lives in Waikiki. Um, and you know that became this huge conflict between the community um, of the upward streams because they would have had 30 foot cul or yeah 30 foot culverts built um, adjacent to their their neighborhoods just to survive basically just to um, ensure the viability of an area that was never meant to be developed it was a lowland marshy lands with kalo fields kalo fields being taro grows in marshlands. Um, so you kind of start to see that push and play between the, the land, inland and, and the shore. Hello. OK. <laughs> so the role of regulation, I'm thinking about the state of Hawaii, right? They passed the first renewable target energy. Is that what it's called? Um, renewable energy target, uh, the first state in the country to do so for um, for renewable and to create renewable energy sources. And so Hawaii was the first state to do that, which is, you know, quite progressive in a way. But right, the flip side of that is what does the infrastructure look like to create, to make this happen? And so you think of wind farms, right? What does a wind farm look like on an island? <laughs> Um, it takes up a lot of space, right? Um, many Kanako Weavey have protested the construction of these wind farms because they are, they, they murder basically birds, right? Um, um, indigenous species. And also there's health implications. There's studies that show that these wind farms can harm um, your hearing. And so there's been a lot of pushback in that way, but Many other Kanakawivi are also arguing that, um, you know, you're not against sustainability initiatives. Just that type of infrastructural large-scale project may not work in a place like Hawaii. Perhaps we can think about solar farms as being an alternative source of energy. And so there's these different types of conversations that are happening at the state level that definitely don't go far enough in thinking about um, how to address um, uh, climate change issues, um, but that's just one way of thinking about it statewide. I think you can speak probably more specifically about um, local policies on the Big Island and how they're coming about. I know on Maui, in the, in a, the last couple of years, um, they've quote unquote allowed <laughs> the construction of Hale, right, with modifications um, to account for contemporary issues, say like fire regulations, right? So they've had to sort of alter what a hale would look like. Um, and so I, for a while, very short while, I worked as an architectural historian at Mason in Honolulu and um, they would construct like replica hale and a lot of the um, critique from builders would be there's this sense in Western design that everything needs to be straight and perfect, right? When you're creating a hale and you're using the resources from the land, you're using the trees, you're using wood and bark and all the things, it's going to be curved, right? It's going to have this, not just aesthetic, but it's functional, right? When you're thinking about how to lash, right, these forms together, it needs to bend, it needs to work in those ways. And so that's some of the pushback that, um, indigenous builders were getting from Western architects about designing Hale and how it fits into the regulations of Maui County, um, quote unquote, permissions <laughs> to build Hale. And then I add, so yeah, the, the Hale code is now statewide. Oh, it is, okay. Um, yeah, and the, the fire regulation on it is pretty strict and you have to be a certified Hale builder to um, permit one. Which so I didn't. Ha I had a picture of Francis Sinachi. He's the um, chief uh, architect of Hale. Um, he's based out of Hana, 
so I did have a picture of Uncle Scotty. Uncle Scotty was trained under um, Francis Sinecci. And yeah, I mean, on that point of like, there's no definitive, you know, um, length, width, height of a hale. Um, it's all based, as I, I was taught, it's all based on the the um, artistic decisions of the Halle builder, um, in which Uncle Scotty would joke, it's based on their size. Um, un <laughs> Uncle Francis is, is a pretty short guy. Uncle Scotty's a pretty big guy. Um, anyways, uh, then as far as housing regulations, so yeah, on, so one in Hawaii County, you run into all kinds of problems between, so Puna has been, well, South, South Hawaii Islands, so like, Hawaiian Ocean View, or uh, Hove, Hawaiian Ocean View Estates, and then Ka'u have also often been considered like the wild, wild west, the last western frontier. Nice colonial way to think about it. Um, Puna all similarly um, was thought of, thought of as that. So to this day, there's still a lot of unregulated um, development um, because people see it as a place where you're not going to be regulated. And it's true. There's not enough capacity in Hawaii County to regulate all of the um, non permanented structures um, in, the, in the district. The district's huge, as um, some joke, it's the size of Belgium or the size of, I forget, there was another reference recently. Anyways, it's a, it's a huge, vast um, piece of land. I think it's Puna's the size of Oahu, I think, yeah. uh, as far as land mass goes. Oh. Um, anyways, so there's a lot of unregulated things, and now people are trying to conform because the county is starting to crack down to collect. Um, taxes, and then also to collect fees, um, and there's a lot of pushback from department or from Kanaka Oiwi who live in Department of Hawaiian Homelands homesteads um, because they don't think they should have to apply um, to the state apparatus, which is true for tribes in the U.S. Um, they regulate their own their own tribes, their sovereign nations, but for Kanaka Oiwi that's not true. They still follow under they fall under the state regulations. So it causes all kinds of problems. Um, so Maku'u, which is a um, homestead that I have worked a little bit with, um, they're actually developing their own kind of legal overlays to create more flexibility um, within their development. Within their development, so it'll allow for more, for example, more units per acre. Um, I don't know. I could go on and on, but that's probably. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much for your work and for sharing it with us today. I, Dr. Miller, I would love to hear you talk a little bit more about the indigenous design process and, and how you came to know about that and, and you know, document it. Yours works? Oh, yours works. <laughs> just didn't have it turned on. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I guess, so the way I first came really to thinking through this was, so my, my doctoral research was actually in, in Eilang Kainad, Marshall Islands, uh, working with uh, remagical communities in Namrik and in Majuro. Um, but it was really through working with uh, families in Namrik, talking about um, climate adaptation and how they they foresaw them themselves being able to maintain and sustainably manage um, their coastlines into future generations and most housing in the Marshall Islands is coastal at least on outer atolls where there's you know in, in Madro there's less space obviously because you have to go inland um, and so then therefore it impacts a, a sea level rise and more frequent inundation events storm events etc have a bigger impact um, so that's where I started to really learn a lot through um, Isa Peter, who was who's one of the elders on Namrik, about um, really, like really the traditions, and you know he spoke a lot to how the traditions um, in architecture were, or in development of Monkidrik, the thatch house, traditional thatch house, made sense because they responded to climactic events. They were raised on stilts. The under under space provided um, habitable area or just area for socializing, keep out of the hot sun. 
Um, if anyone's been, I don't know if anyone's been to the assholes, but it's very hot. Um, and it's low, and there's not a lot of cover. Anyways, so the structure was very, you know, as we know, vernacular intelligence. It's very responsive to the climate. Um, but, you know, the, what I realized within thinking through an, an indigenous um, design knowledge is that it's not just about the architecture. Actually, the architecture plays a very minor role. What's most important is the land management system and that indigenous resource management that allows for that architecture to exist in the first place is what's significant. Um, and then that's where you get, so in the Marshall Islands, it's the Wado system. In, in Hawaii, it's the Ahakua system. These ecological systems that have land managers. So in Hawaii, it's the Konohiki. In the Marshall Islands, it's the Alup. And they're responsible for carrying on matrilineal, in the case of Marshall Islands, matrilineal knowledge of how to maintain, properly maintain that land, that land through indigenous knowledge systems. And that starts to build, so I kind of gave a story of a bit of the process in Hale construction, where you have to be able to know how to grow the resource sustainably. So it's not just benefiting you, but it's going to benefit your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. Um, you know, right, we generally have this idea of five generations or ten generations. Um, well, ten generation thinking, I joke with some of my colleagues from that are Anishinaabeg or one tall fan, that they, they think in seven or ten generations. And I was like, well, we think in five because it's split. You know, five back, five forward, and that's good enough. Anyways, but yeah, so it's, so that's, I guess, why I started leaning more towards planning. So I like teaching urban planning now um, because uh, it is, I see indigenous design as, the architecture is important. The architecture develops this, a spatial ontology that's fit for the cultural specific, specificity of a community. And within that spatial ontology, it, there's respect to the relationship with land, there's respect to the relationship of elders, um, et cetera. But to get to that architecture, you have to have that resource management as a central component. I don't know if that quite answers the question. Thank you so much. Dr. Moses, do you want to respond before we close? That was great. Okay, okay wonderful. Um, so I want to thank Dr. Moses and Dr. Miller warmly for this amazingly um, insightful and, and um, we, we need to collaborate here in San Diego on some of these, these projects that you're working on and see how we can carry this forward with some of the groups that are coming through around Pacific Islands, but also with local communities, local indigenous communities, with the Kumeyaay specifically. So to be continued through the design lab and, and through urban studies and planning, through visual arts, through all the departments here. And James Miller, I hope that we can bring you back very soon to be in this dialogue on troubling housing process and pedagogy in Oceania and um, bringing these indigenous strategies that you're talking about um, toward restorative land, climate, and housing justice, uh, um, connecting them across our community. So thank you very much. We have our last Design at Large seminar two weeks from today. There will be no meeting next week. And in two weeks, we have a seminar um, that I'd like to share with everyone. So bear with me while I share screens. For those of you who are, who are watching the screens, we're not projecting here, but if you're looking at a computer, you're able to see um, that our next seminar will be with Vince Diaz, Daniel Keefe from the University of Minnesota, Making Knowledge, Making Kin, Making Native Canoes. And this is a project um, that will be also a hybrid event here in this room as well as online on Zoom. It's indigeneity is about making good on kinship with the world. And this presentation is about how academic and transdisciplinary partnership with a variety of indigenous communities around canoe building and rebuilding of waterways has been catalytic and generative for all involved. And we'll have some local groups that are engaged in canoe building, um, including a Chamorro group and uh, Kumeyaay boat builders, as well as Vince Diaz and um, Daniel Keefe and the people that they're working with there across uh, Chamorro canoes and um, 
local indigenous canoes there. So see you all in two weeks. Thank you.